this is gonna be your best Listen. podcast ever. <laughs> Epicurean, but OFC and pink lemonade's pretty damn good. It'll put your boat in the marsh. <laughs> Jesus did not die so you could eat yellow number five. <laughs> Excitable. Nose starts off gentle with noticeable sense of grain that takes shape in the form of fresh baked bread. Ma'am, you're in the wrong podcast. <laughs> Educated ish. I have used the term overproof for so long um, without really knowing what it if it was. Yeah, it, because for is me, there a definition officially? Welcome to bitches and bourbon. How are you today? Hello, April. I am feeling fantastic now. Now? Yeah. As as opposed to when? Well, we had half a bottle each last night. <laughs> it has been the worst fucking day. Can I just tell you that? First, there was the baby hangover, yes. which I never get. You never get. And never get. Then and I was surprised that I did not feel worse this morning. I was morning. shocked you didn't yes. feel worse this morning, because you usually <laughs> yes. get them. Going sealed to trash in three hours. It was, was bad. It was good. a great, it was, like, whatever. It was I don't a great know. time. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, before we get too deep into that, um, we would like to, Reba and I would like to introduce, we have two guests with us today, and I'm Woo-hoo. super excited about that. Yes. Um, this will we be. We love having guests. We do. It's always so much fun. Um, this will be a Books with Bitches and Bourbon episode, and there was a book that we read, um, The Mere Wife, which was one of my favorite books ever. The book club, not so much. But I had the fortune of being in class with these two women. They're not actual Books with Bitches and Bourbon members yet, uh, but we were part of the same Beowulf Senior Seminar class at Georgia Southern University. So I knew they had read it, and they just happened to be two of the smartest women I know. And so I asked them if they would come join us on the podcast, and they said yes. Yay! Yay. Um, So first, we have Sadie. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hello. Um, Sadie, I... I am studying English because I want to be a writer, and so I did from that uh, Beowulf senior seminar class, I used The Mere Wife in my senior thesis that I'm going to publish on masculinity and heroism, which I think is super interesting with all of the pop culture and superhero stuff we have going on right now, too. And have you watched The Boys? I love (laughs) The Boys. I love it so much. I actually am going to have, I'm going to expand my thesis and I'm going to have a section just on The Boys and a section on satirizing hero culture. Nice. When Pop Claw popped that dude's head. Oh my god. (laughs) I was oh and and that's season one, so if it's a spoiler for you, I don't know what to tell you about that. It's been three years though, so I mean that's really your own fault. (laughs) You should be able to go ahead and do that. Now you may want to go watch if you haven't yet. Yes. (laughs) So good. It's so good. And and I'm I'm I think the thing that I'm most curious about that series is what was the drug budget? Because (laughs) somebody Somebody was jacked on something, <laughs> and it just keeps getting better or worse depending <laughs> on your definition of the what show. that means. Amazon Prime really just gave them no budget and was like, "Do whatever you want." Yes, make this entertaining. <laughs> yes, but somebody was buying weed or coke or something. Yeah. Like somebody was buying. There were drugs involved. Yeah, for there's sure. no way that was thought of sober. <laughs> no, that, no, just and I don't care what anybody says about that. It just doesn't happen. No, absolutely not. <laughs> All right, and so we also have Miss Catherine. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm Catherine. Um, like April, I am also going to be going on to grad school after I finish this degree. Uh, and the paper I wrote during the Beowulf class was an eco-critical analysis, which plays in really well to looking at the mere wife and a lot of the themes that come about from suburbia and development. So I found that interesting. See, told y'all, smartest fucking women I know. <laughs> like, just go ahead and pour a drink now. I was, was going to say, let me just keep my drink going. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and it, Catherine would not go to Ireland with me. I begged. Because she's rude. But it was it was very rude. <laughs> like, it took me a minute to, like, get over my feelings about that. Like, I'm like, Catherine, please go to Ireland with me. And she said, no. <laughs> Period. Like, there was like there was no stop. discussion. Full yeah. stop. Like, yeah. she didn't even try to sugarcoat it or anything. She was just, like, full no. And I'm still a little bitter about that, if you want to know the truth. We can't tell. No, I am. I am. I really am. I'd have gone with you. In fact, I did go. 
<laughs> she's like, oh, tell them why you wouldn't go. Well, somebody has to take care of my baby. It's a cat, it's by a the cat. way. <laughs> I just want to say that really fast. It is. It's, it's a cat. It's a cat. And she has a ton of people that would have taken care of her baby. And cat. Cat. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Sadie. We're all keeping it real here. <laughs> She's like, I can't leave Tabitha. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God. Fine. All right. So even though it is Books with Bitches and Bourbon, we are still going to go around the table one more time and have everybody tell you about their cup. All right. So, Reba, what's in your cup? Um, some Tito's and water. Flavored. Sparkling water. Sadie, what are you doing? I'm drinking Highland Park 18. Isn't it delicious? It's so delicious. I love Highland Park. It's so delicious and that 18 is like it's my favorite bottle on my shelf it's so smooth it's delicious it makes me so happy what about you ma'am let's talk about what you're doing i am just drinking a frozen bahama mama daiquiri thing <laughs> it's not a daiquiri <laughs> thing that implies liquor <laughs> it's like a wine it's spritzer. a wine cooler <laughs> you know, if you were with frozen us on, wine cooler yeah if you were with us on one of our tiktok lives like a month ago this is the bullshit that reba bought to my house <laughs> And she's like, hey, we're drinking these. And I'm like, did you bring Fireball, too? Like, the <laughs> fuck right now? Those are so much better than Fireball. <laughs> there's well, no, my there's no doubt the, about that. To the Crown Apple. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in case you haven't noticed, Catherine's our big drinker. <laughs> <laughs> I, too, am doing Tito's and sparkly water uh, and soda water. Um, after the day that I've had, I just needed something that wasn't... I needed a day drinker, and I yes. don't typically day drink bourbon or whiskey in general. Neither of us needed that that early today. Yeah, no. After Good. last night. Last night was ridiculous. <laughs> All right, so now we're back from our snack break. What you probably missed, because I'm going to have to go back and edit it, <laughs> is while I was looking for some notes that I had on this book, we decided it was snack time. <laughs> and who the hell knew that it was so fucking loud in these mics? <laughs> like, reach your hand in the Reese's bag. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> And then we have chips. And like, <laughs> kettle, kettle cooked chips kettle to cook. top it off. <laughs> Very crunchy. You missed the great conversation about how, interestingly enough, Sadie is allergic to tomatoes. Who knew? And then it's in everything. I didn't every, know. Every flavor of Doritos uses tomato powder. Who knew? Who knew? I didn't know. Maybe now they we just, do. Maybe they just have it out for you. I, I'm a crapshoot of a human body. <laughs> so I mean, that tracks. <laughs> I don't even know what that means, but it's hilarious. <laughs> what? She, she's just excited because she notes. found her little notes. <laughs> I thought I got rid of them, but I didn't. Yeah, they're right here. I love that. That's great. <laughs> We're never getting through this episode, but that's fine. This is what we do here. Um, so Maria Deviana Headley did this book, released it in 2018. It comes in at 308 pages, and it is classified as fiction. So I am going to be very honest. I only signed up for that Beowulf senior seminar class because I needed a senior seminar class. Um, it fit in my schedule, and Catherine was doing it. Like, that's literally, like, Sadie was a bonus surprise, right? What? Did you just hit yourself? What did you just do? Did you kill the frog? <laughs> you killed the frog. Oh, no. Will you grab me a paper towel? You killed the fucking frog. Will you grab me a paper towel? God damn it. <laughs> Why is there a frog so precariously <laughs> close to the window? Go away Let from me. Are you sure he's dead? Where is he? That's not the frog. That's not the one. That one's been there. <laughs> This frog killed himself. That's not the frog. Our frog is right I knew there. That, that was not okay. a freshly dead frog. Our frog is right there. Yes, I know. I knew that it was not a freshly dead frog, but I looked up the window and I turned around and there's just a dead frog hanging from the window. What the fuck is happening? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. I just can't with today. I just cannot. So, uh, yeah, let's just go back to bed. Yeah, I. So I go to get the bottle of booze out of my car this morning. Your very precious, special, love my car. I don't even smoke in my right. car. Which you don't is do like anything. You don't. Do you? Do you? Pers I know you don't allow the kids to take food in the car. Do you eat in your car? Sometimes, like okay. snacks, not like full meals and stuff. So I'm very particular. I've never, I never even imagined I would ever own a car like that. Right. So I'm very particular about her. Mm -hmm. And bottle of 1792. 
I guess the heat got to it, did something to the seal, pushed the cork, and there's a half a fucking bottle of bourbon sitting in my fucking front seat. And I was like, <sighs> trying not to cry. I tried, and I didn't. I was very proud of me. I'm so proud Good of job. you. I did not cry. I cleaned it up. I put one of those little odor eater thingies in there, and then I went and took a long get over yourself shower. Although, like Mike said, it it at least is a good don't <laughs> don't baking spices. It's not it's not the appropriate air freshener for my car. No, just stop. And it was all over my iPad. American yeah. White Oak. It was everywhere. It was, it was everywhere. Yeah. Mostly it's in the seats. I, my car is going to smell like whiskey for like ever. <laughs> You're going to get pulled over and they're always gonna <laughs> going to be thinking they jail. You, they, you I'm, just finished a bottle. <laughs> I'm going to keep this podcast like as on, your proof. Yeah, yes. I'm like, look, we even talked about it. <laughs> yes. Here's the thing that happened. Let me take a picture. Like, <laughs> fuck me right now. Like, this Let is. Let me re- show you a receipt of my cleaning bill for I was today. So <laughs> mad. I was so mad. And then I didn't even have any leather cleaner. So is that what's on its way. Yeah, tomorrow it'll get here tomorrow, and I'm like. fuck this oh did the leather like absorb it yes i didn't know leather could get dirty oh yes yes leather stains and you have to clean it with particular stuff leather yeah 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 it was bad it was white leather and it was bad anywho so then we're doing that and then my husband realizes his laptop is all fucked up um and then i realized we're having um we're recording Bitches and bourbon, <laughs> books with bitches and bourbon, and I have no snacks. Um, and I'm. <laughs> and so now we're here. So now I'm drinking. Hey. I'm drinking. Cheers. 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 <laughs> so, anywho, The Mere Wife, Maria Daviana Headley, is classified as fiction, published in 2018, comes in at 308 pages. Um, and like I said, that those are the only reasons that I. Let me go back because we're going to redo this because I'm going to take out. I don't know what I'm going to do. Fuck. Look, <laughs> some of this is going to be edited. I don't know how this is going to end up when it hits to you, but here's what we're going to do. So, like, I already told you, or maybe I didn't because maybe I edited it out. I don't know. Um, I, only t- <laughs> I only took this senior seminar class um, because Catherine was in it, and I needed the class. And I was not – I'll tell you what I wasn't. I wasn't super – I wasn't super excited about a Beowulf class. And I had never read Beowulf. I'd read Beowulf in no. high school, which was 28 years ago. Yeah, I mean, oh, at 20? 20 years ago. I was, no. No, mine's been 22. God, oh, 30 years ago almost. Fuck <laughs> me. Um, so, anywho, but the, the perf- math isn't mathing in my head you, right now. I'm 46. I graduated So, 30 years. Yeah, 30 years ago, I would have been 16. So. Oh. Yeah, so uh, like almost 30 years ago. And you graduated in 94. 94. Yeah, I graduated in 94. Um, yes, I know. Yes, and Sadie's looking to be I'm going. I'm keeping my comments to myself. Yeah, Sadie's like, Sadie was like, was my mom? <laughs> was my mom graduated high school at that point? I don't think so. Is April older than my mom? <laughs> You're not. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Carry the one. <laughs> well, my... Uh, as a testament to just who I am as a person, my mom was forced to be homeschooled, and she hated it. And so she graduated two years early out of spite right. to my grandmother. She, nice. So she did all four years of high school coursework in, in a matter two. of two years. Nice. So she graduated high school when she was 16. Very cool. So wow. she, yeah. She was supposed to graduate high school in 95. But she graduated in 93. Yeah. My husband graduated in 93. Okay. <laughs> my husband graduated a year early, and I think it was 90, 94. Yeah, I yeah, because he's yeah. a year younger than me yeah. by a little. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, but our professor, um, Dr. Jameson, I thought she did an excellent job curating the books that we read because we didn't just read Beowulf. We read Beowulf, Grendel's Mother, um, Eaters of the Dead, which was Michael Crichton, and that also the Thirteenth Warrior movie, um, The Mere Wife. We read something else too. Grendel. Those mm-hmm. were the six that we read. So, The Mere Wife was definitively my favorite because what Headley does is she takes the Beowulf narrative and she reimagines it into a twenty-first century story, where Grendel's mother is a 
and, and she never says Iraqi war, but we imply yes. it's implied. And I, and I appreciated that she didn't do that because she let the story be the story and yes. kind of instead of inviting other baggage into the mix. But whatever war it is, Dana Mills is a POW in this war. While she's a POW, she is raped. Um, she wakes up and finds herself six months pregnant and she can't remember anything. But um, the U.S. forces do rescue her. But now that she's pregnant, they're wondering if maybe she wasn't a cooperative. And so she, it seems like she gets pretty She's tortured as a terrorist. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, like she gets tortured, so she runs kind away. Of shunned. Yeah, so she runs away and into the mountains of her old hometown, which has now been redeveloped into this huge swanky gated community. And she gives birth to Grendel, and that's Beowulf is actually Ben Wolf. He's a cop in the town, um, who the, also is a former vet too. Yes, a former vet. He is a veteran. Yep. And then you have Roger and Willa, who are kind of like well Theo, and. The King, head of the yeah. society. Rucker. Yeah. Rucker. Yep. So I, I I thought it was, I loved it. I, I really it's enjoyed it. It's a really it. good book. I really enjoyed it. I I went into the senior seminar class because I needed a senior seminar. It fit my schedule. And I was like, ooh, Beowulf, this will be exciting. And then having you and Kat in the class too, I was like, this is perfect. <laughs> now, had oh you guys God. known each other before that class? We yes. had some classes together, but we were not... Hanging out. No. Well, I remember Sadie because she wrote some very passionate discussion posts in our 17th and 18th century American literature. What? Oh, dear God. I I don't even remember what this is about. That's all. That's because it's that's all. That's like the only speed you have. (laughs) That's the only speed you have. We get up there. We have so at the end of our senior seminar, everybody has to give like a 12 to 15 minute talk, right? (laughs) Um, At minute 15, I look at Catherine. I'm like, she's not slowing down. (laughs) Minute 20, (laughs) Doctor Jameson. Was I really up there for 20 minutes? At minute 20, Doctor Jameson is like, Doctor Jameson is like, we have to go now. I didn't even say half of the things that I planned on saying. <laughs> That's the worst part. But you do so good. Like, you do so good. Thank you. It's always very interesting. I do really appreciate that we're talking about the mirror wife, though, because I feel like Kat's eco-crit of Beowulf really applies to this book. Right. Because yes. Dana's been removed from her hometown. She's done all of these things, and she comes back, and her whole life and all of the livelihood she's clung to has been ripped away from her and then redeveloped. And I think that's something we see in the original Beowulf as well. I was really glad that Catherine did. First, before I, why don't you explain to everybody what we're talking about right now? Beowulf. What's EcoCrit? EcoCrit is looking at literary texts and seeing how nature is represented in the text or how nature is not represented in the text. Is nature absent from a text in which it obviously should be playing a role? That that says something about the text itself. And then you can look at uh, how the how nature is represented in the sense of is this a positive interpretation or a positive relationship between humans and nature? Or is nature seen as an antagonist? Uh, it also can be used metaphorically in so many different ways. Uh, and that's a lot of what I enjoyed looking at in Beowulf with nature and how it was often demonized or used to make characters seem very negative associated with those scary wilderness aspects of nature. Catherine's definitely the smartest of us. De- definitely <laughs> exactly. the smartest yes. of I, us. I do not appreciate the pressure. That that <laughs> I, I did mind. go like until my senior year of high school thinking the word miniseries was pronounced miniseries <laughs> because I had only ever read it or heard my grandmother say it. And that was all that was all I had. No one corrected me. And then my senior year, I was like, yeah, in the Pride and Prejudice miniseries with Colin Firth. And my professor was like, the what? Oh, spell it. Spell it on the board. And I had to go and I wrote the word on the board. And he was like, miniseries? And as I saw it, I was like, oh, my God, that makes sense. Of course that's what it is. What? I think that Dr. Air and I has one of my favorite approaches to mispronouncing words that I've ever heard. When you hear someone reading to you out loud and they mispronounce a word, it means that they're a reader. It means that they've only ever seen the word because they've read it. So it's never something to laugh about. I mm-hmm. completely, yes. I have heard it's that. one of my favorite things I've heard. I've Professor heard Snape has his good qualities. I will say that. <laughs> I, have, I have heard that same idea before. And the minute I heard it, I was like, absolutely yes. right Makes absolutely complete sense. yes i remember when i was reading the harry potter the harry potter series um before the movies any of the movies had come out i was like 
what is this girl's name? Did you say Hermione? Hermione? <laughs> Hermione? <laughs> like, I, didn't know, yes. I didn't know what it was. I'm it is like, not. It is not pronounced how to spell. I'm like, I had no idea how this girl's name was pronounced. And I'm like, well, I don't know. Now I'll do this thing. Google is a beautiful thing. And, and yeah, and kids and and kids these days. Kids these days in tarnation. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but so. <laughs> I'm going to be an old woman that uses the word tarnation. <laughs> I've just decided. We, we, we had that conversation last night, actually. But and so Google is a beautiful thing because I'll just go on there and like, how do you pronounce? How do you pronounce? How do you pronounce? <laughs> and then sometimes it's great. And then sometimes you're like, I don't think that's right. And then you go to the comments and the comments are like, the fuck are you saying right now? <laughs> I'm like, thanks. I read over the break. Well, over this past year, I read this um, book, se- fantasy book series from the author Sarah J. Mass, Moss. And one That's of the Court of Roses or whatever. Yes. Okay. A Court of Thorns and Roses. That's series. it. You're like the 80 billionth it's person in your so age and gender demographic that good. says you have to read this book. <laughs> I'm trying to get my male friends to read it, and that is that's like carrying a pail of water with a hole in it uphill. <laughs> but I, I'm working on it. Um, but there's a character in the book series, and I I have my very specific pronunciation for it. And it is contested, but I went into Google and I put, how do you pronounce? And I typed the name in and Google pronounced it as Rysand, not Rysand. So which is it? I will die on this hill. I think it's Rysand. <laughs> the author said that it's Rysand and I was in, a, in, a, post, in a post-structuralist society. We don't I give a shit. I respectfully with... disagree <laughs> yes. with Sarah J. Moss. Thank you. You and are dead, ma'am. I, I love you. You're a great writer. Please put the book out next year. Um, <laughs> But respectfully, I feel like when it's the full name, it's Rysand, and when it gets shortened to R H Y S, I can totally see that being pronounced as Reese and not Rice. Well, we know it's pronounced Reese. We know it's yes. We had someone in our Beowulf class named Reese, and that's how yeah. he spelled his name. I can get on board with that. But when it's the full spelling, I will die on this hill. It's Rysand. <laughs> okay, but Sadie, darling, is it worth dying on the hill for? No, not. And, 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 and <laughs> there's and a lot of things that I'm willing to do. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Moreover, if the shortening of the name is Reese, then it logically follows that the name is Reese. No, because you can get Bill from William. And if that makes sense, but that's or Jim from James, you can't tell different. me I'm we wrong. We, we're not gonna, you're not going to take William. You're not going to take William, shorten it to Will, and then it be well. Will? Yeah. <laughs> not going to do that. It's B- Bill from William. I don't know how the fuck that ever happened yeah. anyway, because B isn't even in the original name, but whatever. Yes. Um, what about Jim from James? Or R- Dick from Richard. Let's talk right? about like how that happens. I, I don't know if that was so much a phonetic change as a personality change. <laughs> That's what I'm probably thinking as well. I don't think I've ever met a Richard nicknamed Dick that wasn't, that wasn't also a dick. A dick. <laughs> You earn that shit. <laughs> yeah. But you know what's really funny though? We had I had a senior. My chief. sister's name is Emma and her nickname is Lucy, because that's short for Lucifer. <laughs> <laughs> so <I> died. <laughs> She's figured it out and she's accepted it. She actually she's accepted she it. found out and she's like, You guys call me Lucy because of Lucifer and we didn't say anything. And she just looked at us and was like, I mean, I guess that makes sense. You guys suck and then walked out and we're like Good for her. Fair. Good for her. Like I own it and I don't have to be like I don't have to be happy about yeah. it. Yeah. She recognizes. I'm, I'm all right with yeah. that. I'm all right with that. And now I'll own it. Yeah. That was so Watch speak, she's also fifteen, so heaven help us when she's an actual adult. <laughs> oh my God! We can put Six her in, years from now. Woo. We'll put her and Morgan together, and they can just like live their best lives. I'd love to see that. My child. Yes. Fifteen. Oh you God. are going. This is going to be the one of yes. your favorite stories you've yes. ever heard I'm in so your excited. life. I already know what story she's going. So, um, my kid is a member of the GSA at okay. school, and. The school, the high school, has a policy to where um, non-school affiliated clubs cannot put up posters, right? So you have to be like football, cheerleader, beta, like those people can Mm -hmm. have posters. But like young Democrats, young Republicans, GSA, all of those folks, they can... GSA, like the the Gay Straight Alliance. Oh, okay. Gay Straight Alliance. So they cannot put posters up. Well, she had an issue. And so she requested a meeting with the principal Mm -hmm. to discuss this issue. And he agreed. I already love this story. <laughs> he agreed. And that afternoon, I get a phone call. And it's the principal. 
And he says, so this is what happened. Are you aware that we had a meeting? I'm like, yes, she told me. Um, He said, well, we were in the meeting for a little while, and she kept playing with her phone. He said, and I finally asked her, he goes, are you recording this? And she says, I am. Is that okay? He says, no, that is not okay. Why? The school has a policy where the kids cannot record kids or teachers. They can't record stuff in school. Like, kids can't go around with their phones recording all day. He goes, no, it's not okay. He goes, and you didn't even ask. My child looked this man dead in his face, and I know it's true because the principal's the one that told me. My child looked this man dead in his face and said, well, George is a single-party consent state. I didn't have to ask. <laughs> I love her. You can have her. That happened. <laughs> oh, that my happened. God. Yeah. Yeah. That was last mm-hmm. year. Mm-hmm. And we still have three years left. Oh, my God. <laughs> yes. I, if you put Morgan, me, and my sister Emma in a room, we could take over the – we could we could overthrow the government. <laughs> she, is, she is pretty amazing. <laughs> and she just – With I, that attitude, amazing. I was like and, – and I did. I told her. I, when, she, when she got home, we talked about it. I said, look, you are not in trouble. You're not in trouble. I said, technically – Technically, you are right. I said, and quite frankly, after this conversation, I have some questions about the recording rules in school, like what exactly is going on there that Mm -hmm. you can't document things. So I have some questions. I said, however, I said, you really should think about, I said, you probably owe him an apology because he accepted this meeting with you on good faith to kind of discuss and just dis- and talk, mm-hmm. you were trying to like catch him in a gotcha and have him on recording saying something stupid. I said your intention sucked. I said so maybe so maybe you owe him. And I'm, I'm not going to make you apologize. Mm-hmm. She looked at me and she was well. She said you put it that way. <laughs> she was I guess I could see how that could be construed. It wasn't my intention when it absolutely was. Right. But she's like, <laughs> but she's like that wasn't. We my already intention. know you. Yeah. <laughs> like, we she, know who you are. Yeah, I'm like I'm like oh my Kudos god. Kudos to you as a mother because I think that is a super important lesson to teach your children just like in writing how connotation matters intention and what you're doing matters especially when language is such a dying like it's just such a dying aspect of society i feel like no one respects language anymore and interpretation is now at all aspects of like they anything can be misconstrued yes Mm -hmm. you never would have had like nowadays it could be interpreted in like 10 different ways of what originally was maybe maybe two different ways could be interpreted right yeah like everything that you do is under so much more that's why i'm just like fuck it yeah like (laughs) i am i'm just like one of two things when we talk is going to happen like depending on what i'm doing like either i'm not intending to be offensive in which case, if you're offended, then A, you need to, we need to talk about it because you obviously don't know me um, well enough. Or B, I'm intending to be offensive and then you're offended so fucking good. That's what, right. that's what, I, that's what I meant. You offended me. Awesome. <laughs> Neil Gaiman does such a great job on discussing um, offensive language. Are you watching The Sandman on Netflix? I am not. It's great. So I can really only do like one series at a time because I really don't have, I I don't, A, I don't watch a lot of TV. B, my husband loves it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I can really only do like, and right now I've got a few. I've got um, big, oh, my, my husband has watched every episode of Big Brother ever made. (laughs) Are you watching this season? Of course. Oh my God. Of course. Finally is getting good. If if (laughs) Jasmine doesn't come out of this fucking boot, then she is so full of shit. I hate her. Did you see there was a cut shot in this last episode that, like, it wasn't, it's like one of the throwaway cutscenes of what they're, whatever they're doing. She's standing in the pool. You're buoyant in water. (laughs) A. Regardless of your size, you're buoyant. She's standing in a pool with her cane for her sprained ankle that she is more than comfortable doing competitions and jumping off of things onto her ankle and being in positions. And she's like, I'm fine. And And then she walks around the house with a cane. Pain? These fuzzy little caterpillar eyebrows that she does too are wearing me out. Like I just can't stand it. Joseph right now is my favorite. She disrespects Julie on eviction night by her weird sayings one more time. I'm, I'm gonna not, lose it. But she thinks she's so cute. Yes. And but you know what I've noticed about that? Because I have not watched every episode of Big Brother, but mm-hmm. I have watched a lot of them now. Um this is when she compliments Julie, it's the only time I never hear Julie compliment 
a woman back. Yeah. Every single time a woman says, Julie, you look fantastic. Mm-hmm. Julie always says, thank you. So do you. Mm-hmm. Not when Jasmine does it. Because she's doing it to make a spectacle of it. it like is, she's not complimenting with what we were just saying with intention. She's not complimenting her with yes. intention. She's complimenting her to make a spectacle. Safe face for and it, Well, it's always these in and I'm granted, I'm from the West Coast. I'm not from the South, but I've lived in the South for three years. And I, I have a friend who bought me a English to Southern dictionary. <laughs> and so there are some things I know. This my friend Marnie, I love her. She we were talking about something and she's talking to me and my friend Joe, and both of us are from well, Joe's from Pennsylvania, but he lived in Seattle for a decade. And I'm from California. So like we're both like really rooted in the West Coast and West Coast vernacular. And Marnie makes a comment where she was like, oh my gosh, yeah, we're going to have to eat crow for dinner. I immediately text Marnie and I was like, you need to tell Joe that you aren't serious about it being crow. (laughs) She's like, no, that's a saying. I'm like, we don't know that. Joe spent 20 minutes looking at butcher shops, (laughs) looking for where to buy crow to make for dinner. (laughs) Megan Thee Stallion, who I love. Between Megan Thee Stallion and Beyonce's new albums, all of my insecurity (laughs) issues are solved. All right, so where do we leave off on the mayor wife? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> because I did not know how to get this train back in the station. <laughs> Literally or I figuratively? Either way. Either way, I did, not know, I did not know how to bring it back. So thank you so much for asking. You're welcome. Um, I What I really enjoyed about Catherine's um, EcoCrit, because I had no experience with EcoCrit pre- uh, previously, so I learned a lot about that. But what I liked is I never considered the fact that my stance on when my the way I did my senior semin, uh, seminar for the Beowulf was somebody in the class or one of the articles that we read asked what makes Grendel a monster, and my answer was the shaper, the storyteller made Grendel the monster. Yes. So now there's all of these other possibilities that we could that could have been true, but the shaper told chose not to tell that story. So when Catherine started discussing the eco crit angle, I was like, of course. Like, this, these people come into your home, they forcibly remove you, destroy everything that, you've established. You, that you've lived on your entire life to build this huge whatever, and now you're the bad guy? Like, like you're pissed you're off and enemy. you're the bad guy? And, it, and interestingly enough, is for a text whose age is really unknown. Like, people, some people say it's like... What six what? six to eighteen hundred, and then other people are like, no, it's maybe it's the fourteenth, thirteenth, fourteenth century when it was actually first written down. Nobody knows exactly when Beowulf was created, uh, but the truth is, if you read Beowulf, it reads like almost every fictionalized, colonized literature does. And and I thought that was super interesting, and mm-hmm. had never even considered it until you did the work that you did. That's where we were with Beowulf. Thank you. I feel like it's. You make a really good point because it's something that is, when you read the original text, it is something that is very easily overlooked. What's up, sexy? I'm going to reset that. She was talking to me. (laughs) Okay. And, uh... Oh, you smell good. Are you sure you're just going to your mama's? Going to the titty bar. (laughs) (laughs) Have you talked to my husband? No, I figured I'd let him He's already at the titty bar. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to go, uh, to the store after. If you need anything, just text eggs. Are, are you trying to give me a suggestion about what I need with that little stance right there? <laughs> it was a pose. <laughs> oh, he's flirting. I need some WD-40. <laughs> Shopping list. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> well, no shit. <laughs> Oh my god! And and just and just when we get it back on track, it just all goes derails again. <laughs> derails it's in the train derails, station. It's fine. I mean, I think that is really fitting given the book that we're talking about. Oh yes! <laughs> oh my god! Nice. Say more, Catherine. You're Excellent right. Excellent segue. Excellent. Continue. <laughs> well, I don't want to spoil anything. We're not there yet. I guess right. I, well, I mean, we're never going to get there. Let's just go ahead and. <laughs> and this is what ahead. we call in the English department foreshadowing. Yes. <laughs> yeah, because that's spoiler uh, alert. Yeah, like. How does the book end? Everybody dies. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> it really so I guess to put a I guess to put a cap on it, I really I thought I thought that um Headley's ability to make a strong, broken female character, both in the character of Dana Mills and 
Willa, and that was probably one of the another interesting thing that happened because Willa was received so differently mm-hmm. by everybody in the class, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of people didn't like her. I loved her. Like, so Hadley's ability to take two women that are completely different and broken in different places and to show that what that broken, basically what expectations, societal expectations of women mm-hmm. does to the feminine was beautiful. Like society is like, do this, do this, do this, do this. And and instead of instead of encouraging the feminine, they just completely destroy it. And that's basically what happens um, to both of these women. Mm-hmm. And I just I thought it was beautiful. No, I think the women in the original Beowulf are so easily dismissed and so easily I mean, so Will is based on Will Theo and she has a purpose in the original Beowulf. But the purpose is to facilitate the men. It's everything that the women is based off of in the original Beowulf is to facilitate the male story. So I really appreciated in The Mere Wife how it... They were a force to be reckoned with. They were a force to be reckoned with. Willow wasn't going to take shit from anyone. But she had to get there. Yes. Exactly. I and mean, she had. Yeah, to, I mean, she had. Neither to get of there. them were there in the beginning. No. No. Neither of them. They both it had to deal with the trials and tribulations of yeah. all the things that transpired that led them to. It's inevitable. This is just what I have to fucking do mm-hmm. to get through all this shit. Yeah, <laughs> and I mean, in society, a woman's base function is to like procreate, and I think it's the mere wife did a really good job of putting two women in a situation that they didn't want to be in that involved procreation. procreation. And they handled it markedly differently. But Willa had, by her second pregnancy, second or third pregnancy, had the ability to facilitate her societal role. But it was always begrudgingly. She didn't want to facilitate that role. Pregnancy and childbirth and motherhood played a a huge part in this book. So you did. You had Dana, who was raped, and that's Mm -hmm. where her pregnancy came from. I don't know that Willa's first pregnancy was necessarily unwanted. It was unwanted by her mother. Yeah. Right. Like, she unwanted that pregnancy, but I don't know that Willa necessarily did. It was more just when she was pregnant during, like, the current timeline. Right. That mm-hmm. she was not happy with. Well, I think, I think, that, I think that Dylan was a product of supposed to. Like, mm-hmm. this is what you do to create yes. a media-worthy family so that you present picture, this yeah, front, perfect. front right. to the world. And so then you have Roger sleeping with a neighbor, and she ends up pregnant, and Willa takes that baby out. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. let's not mistake that that's exactly Bless what you. happens. Like, she invites that woman over for tea, makes it with the water. Yes. Mm-hmm. It was very, yeah. I mean. Blunt. <laughs> right? Yes. So there was no question about that. So, but that wasn't, it wasn't that Willa was jealous. She absolutely wasn't, but she was protecting her legacy. It's what she's mm-hmm. been taught to do. If she had to sacrifice to make this possible, he needs to sacrifice to also make this possible. But he's already dead. Was he's, Roger already dead? He's when that already happened? dead, yes, because Willa doesn't realize the affair is going on until, until she after. shows up at the funeral, yes. right? She shows up at the funeral and she's, and Willa's like, Hold on a second, yes. and then the other things, and then Will is like, "No, like this is this is not happening." It, like, not only can Roger not treat me like shit mm-hmm. while he's alive, he's not going to make me live through this after he's dead. No, and she just, and and at that point, at that point, you see a huge turn in Willa, mm-hmm. and she's just, she's going to do whatever it is she needs to do to make her life a, a semblance of what she wants it to be. After taking herself off the ledge. Right. Right. I was flipping through the book earlier to refresh my memory, and apparently not well enough. (laughs) Um, And the chapter after the funeral, it's either after the, she's already, it's after the funeral, because she's already found out about the affair. But the chapter where she's kind of looking through the pictures that she finds on his phone, and then she. Here it goes again. Oh my gosh, it's so (laughs) great. It's a different song every time. Oh my gosh, that's so cute. And there's a setting on it where it'll play Christmas music. <gasps> oh my god, I love that. I completely redecorate my entire house for Christmas. <laughs> I don't like Christmas. I oh, said it. I that's, don't. That's Christmas is just, it's Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday. It's family, friends, food. 
period, Relaxing. like a day, yeah. then you get a day off to recover. No and then expectations. <laughs> Christmas is just anxiety producing for me. Ah. I love Advent. I'm Catholic. Mm-hmm. I love Advent because it is pared down focus on mm-hmm. things that are actually important. Um, so Advent, I love Christmas. And the thing I love about Advent is if, if you if you celebrate Advent, then none of the Christmas decorations go up until Christmas Eve. The tree doesn't go up. Right. The decorations go up. Everything goes up on Christmas Eve as this one big f- thing. Mm-hmm. But we always miss out on the damn Christmas tree disposal because it stays up until the Epiphany, which isn't until like the second week of January. So we have mm-hmm. we have all of Christmas, but where everybody else starts in October <laughs> and goes. <laughs> I am a firm believer of holidays staying in their lane. Thank you. Thank you. I yeah. refuse to decorate for I mind I you I take the day off store of work. in August and see shit for Halloween. No. I had to talk my friend down. <laughs> it was like August 1st. She was like, "I want to put my fall decor up Labor Day." <laughs> Labor Day is when summer ends. Memorial Day to Labor Day, that's the holiday cutoff. <laughs> I need you to wait. And I'm like, at least wait until September 1st. Yeah. Everybody Come on. everybody in my ha- in my house knows we do not discuss Christmas until after Thanksgiving, yes. period, paragraph. Thanksgiving is, if you expect me to do this shit for your favorite holiday, mm-hmm. Thanksgiving is my favorite mm-hmm. holiday. And Thanksgiving you are not, deserves more respect. You are not shitting all over. And I get that like the history of Thanksgiving is problematic, whatever. I don't celebrate. That's not Christ- our focus. It's not my focus. <laughs> exactly. I don't give a shit about Christopher Columbus. I really don't care. Like There's a whole <laughs> dissertation of conversation that can be had. I get it. Um, but the idea of Thanksgiving in 2022 mm-hmm. is what I celebrate. Like That's mm-hmm. mine. That's what I do. And On his deathbed, Christopher, Christopher Columbus was adamant he didn't discover anything new. <laughs> like, no one could change his mind. He came here, he discovered the quote-unquote Americas, and he didn't make it north of Cuba in the four times he tried. So, like, whatever. I love Thanksgiving. I don't even care. <laughs> All right. So, anywho, I think that that's the second time the clock has gone off. <laughs> it is. <laughs> So we have been doing this for a minute. Mm-hmm. So I think what we will do is we will say, I love the book. We you guys all, like the book? I loved yes. it. Closing remarks. It's one I would read again. I read the fucker four times. I think it's definitely an easy reread, and I think it would do amazingly well as a movie. I think it would make a ooh, great movie. This is yeah. my public petition, though, for any time a production company wants to make a book a movie, is there needs to be a PA on set, and their whole job description is titled Book Slapper, and any time the director, a producer, someone suggests something that either contradicts the book or isn't in the book or doesn't actually serve the original purpose of the book, that PA is in full rights to just take the book and smack them with it. I, yeah. I like that. No, I like it, too. And I I volunteer for that job. And I wish I would have thought about that a little more um, because I would love to say this would be my suggested casting. Ooh, yeah. But I, I'm, my brain is a complete blank right now. Like, yeah. I have no idea. We're not going to try to pull that out of No, our I think George Clooney would do really gr- well as Roger. I always pictured Regina Hall as Dana Mills. See, I don't even know who that is. I don't either. You don't know who Regina Hall is? All right, so here's what we're going to do. Well, we might. Because we can do this forever. We can, here's what we're going to do right now. We're getting ready um, to pause. No, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna say goodnight. Read The Mirror Wife. Oh, yeah. It was so good. Maria Devana Henley. <gasps> we didn't talk about her Beowulf adaptation. Wait, that's exactly what I was fixing a to say. A daddy can't daddy until his... Oh, no. A boy can't daddy, daddy until his daddy, daddy is dead. dead. Yes. <laughs> Favorite line. It's both of our... And as a matter of fact, when when I had the line, a boy can't... We all know a boy can't daddy until his daddy Daddy's is dead. dead. When I put that in my paper, that was one of Dr. Jameson's responses to mm-hmm. me. She goes, she goes, you know... Sadie's gonna fight you for that, yes. and I'm like, we no, used we can it both in different it. ways. We can though. both, yeah, exactly. We can I'll both right use back. it. We can both use it. So yes, I cannot believe it took me this uh, us this long to circle back to the fact that the mere wife um, came about because Headley did her own translation mm-hmm. of Beowulf, a contemporary translation, and it is it is so it is arguably better than the mere wife. Um, and I know that... that it was Stop making that face, Catherine. <clears throat> it was widely disagreed upon in our class on the merits of this adaptation. Go ahead, Catherine. Uh, I will die on the fact that 
It, the original translation is so much better, and I think that the adaptation in The Mirror Wife is better than Headley's retranslation in that she is taking the story and making new statements about it versus doing this sort of conglomerate of weird half new contemporary stuff and half sort of the same translation that's been done a hundred times before her. So I think I think that Headley's translation was exactly what we needed because translation we learned while we were in the class that like one word can mean two, three, four different things. And depending on which lens you're using to come at that translation is going to change the way you interpret that word. So I thought I thought it was fantastic. I actually have it here, a Beowulf, a new translation. It The first word is bro. The and first, I feel like that tells you everything you need to know about the tone of the translation. Because no one's discounting the original. Ever. Haney did a really great job, especially in the bilingual translation where you get the old English on the left and the translated English on the right. I think she was just trying to create something new. And I think she half succeeded. Fair. Because of the she, Kennings. I think the Kennings is where it comes down to. I think to. she knocked it out of the park. Okay, so I'm going to do this. So this is the very first stanza of Headley's. It goes, bro, tell me we still know how to speak of kings. In the old days, everyone knew what men were. Brave, bold, glory bound. Only stories now, but I'll sound the Spear Dane song hoarded for hungry times. Fuck yes. I was all the way in. I yes. was like, I'm here for it. I am here for it. I am here for it. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was so good. What was the the one that we were just talking about? Um, it's page three in oh, the yeah, book. Oh, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. But being, the being God, he knew how the Spear Danes had suffered the misery they'd mangled through leaderless long years of loss. So the life lord, that almighty big boss, birthed them as earth shaker. Beau's name kissed legions of lips by the time he was half grown, but his own father was still breathing. We all know a boy can't daddy until his daddy is dead. A smart son gives gifts to his father's friends in peacetime. When war woos him as war will, he'll need those troops to follow the leader. Privilege is the way men prime power the world over. That line as well <laughs> is such a good line. So good. And it's so applicable to so many other facets of English, pop culture, government. Just having, like, privilege is how men succeed. Privilege is how people succeed. And I think the mirror wife does a really good job of showing the limits of privilege. And we almost went there when we were talking about wealth, AO, and you mm -hmm. were talking about it was her job to facilitate the men. And then you also said that it's women's primary goal to procreate. And I think when you put those two things together, you get a very interesting discussion about how women, we are supposed to be sexy enough, mm -hmm. right? A, for our husbands to want us mm -hmm. so that we can then procreate. And we're supposed to be sexy enough to, to move social situations to our husband's bidding. Yes. But that's the only sexy you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Like when it doesn't, like Welfeo was not supposed to be beautiful in general. She was supposed to be beautiful Enough. for these purposes. Yeah. And, the then, and then turn it off. Like, like, like now, like don't be a whore. Mm -hmm. like, you, like you're never yeah. allowed exactly. to be a whore. It's it's the description of women living in a gray area. You need to be smart enough that you can talk to a man, but not too smart that you outsmart him. You need to be or make pretty, him feel or make him feel emasculated. emasculated. Oh my god! Don't get me started on feeling emasculated. But like, also, you have to be pretty enough that you know the king Rothgar wants to sleep with you, but not too pretty that, that, that other want people to. also yeah. want to sleep with you. Yeah. It's this gray area that no one talks about. But, when, but so, you need to be pretty enough, sexy enough, so that the men he wants things out of, he we can, can send sway. you. Yes. You we can, can send sway. him. Mm -hmm. Yes. We I'm going to be loyal to opinion. I'm going to be loyal to Rothgar because I also want to sleep with his wife. Right. Right. I in my thesis that I will say so. Doctor Strange: Multiverse of Madness came <laughs> yes. out at the beginning of May. I finished my thesis at the end of April, so before Multiverse of Madness came out. Okay. And in my thesis, I'm discussing like the realm of like feminism to masculinity and how it translates from Beowulf to superhero culture. And in my closing remarks for my senior thesis, I mention it's that it would be interesting to see 
what they do with the Scarlet Witch's character once they remove her uh, her relationship to Vision, her motherhood to children. They've essentially removed these aspects of femininity yes. from her, and all that's left is her power, which is essentially a masculine attribute. And I, I commented, I was like, it's going to be interesting to see if they vilify her. And they did. And then they did. They except took this away for, from her, and then they vilified for, her. Except for they vilified her in such a way because she was attempting to regain those things regain that she the thought that she wants, wants yes. right? Mm-hmm. Like, we're angry because we're never getting vision back. We're never getting the love of our life back. No. But I have She's children. She's too busy figuring out Theseus's ship. Right. I have children. Mm-hmm. And I can go get them because I have this power to regain these things. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, I actually liked what they did with the Scarlet Witch story. I think it could... So the zombie fucking Doctor Strange, like, blew my brain. Mm -hmm. I was like, the fuck are we doing right now? However, it was all salvaged because the jump off the ledge with the cape costume change Mm -hmm. in the beginning saved everything for me. Doctor Strange loves a flourish. I love him. Okay, so outside of Iron Man, he is my second favorite Avenger, period. Mm -hmm. Um, But I like what they... People love an arrogant superhero with a touch of humility. When you give them too much humility, that's, I feel like, where people have a problem. Mm -mm. I don't think it's the humility. I think that Doctor Strange and Iron Man both have a common trait, Mm -hmm. and that's the love of one woman. Like, that's yeah. what those two men it's have. It's not about how many can I yes. get the mm-hmm. attention that's, of. And I think so that's I want the what, attention of that. He yes. wants, I, I, I want the attention of Pepper. On, I'm solely yeah. focused. I think that's what allows women to look at them in all of their asshole. I mean, yes. Reba and I own T-shirts. We have matching T-shirts mm-hmm. that say real women marry assholes. Because we know exactly who our husbands are. Mm-hmm. Right? Our husbands are the biggest assholes on the planet. But they're not dickheads. They're not dickheads. Had a, they're, not dickheads. they're not dickheads. They're not dickheads, but they're the assholes. But they still respect you. And, and and that's what's important. And both of them have only ever loved one woman in their whole lives. Mm-hmm. Both of them have that in common. That's what Doctor Strange has. That's what Iron Man has. And I think that's what allows us as consumers to look at them and go... He's human. He's probably a good person. Mm -hmm. He has this veneer about him, but his ability to be completely in love with a singular person speaks to a part of his character that you can't articulate any other way. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think they have in common. The Scarlet Witch I thought was interesting because they did remove all of her femininity, but then they tried to convince us that it was okay for her to use her power to regain that femininity that maybe this was an okay fight to pick, but she did so without regard to other women. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we really could delve into Mm -hmm. super deeply about how as women, we often say, it's good for me as a woman, and I really don't care what that means for you as a woman. Mm -hmm. I think the feminist movement is wrought with that problematic characteristic Mm -hmm. because the very beginning of the feminist movement in the 60s and the 70s you had white women all over the planet going we deserve to be able to work we deserve to be able to go have careers and live our lives right when there are legions of black women going already working already having to leave their children at home by the time they take care of these other kids yeah like (laughs) that's not our idea of feminism Mm -mm. we would like the right not to work like we would like the right to walk into a store and and not be followed all over the place we would like the right Right. to do a whole host of other different things the next person i date is going to be rich (laughs) i'm over it but i mean so i i really i really think that whole scarlet witch scenario kind of speaks to the way where as women um it, it it takes it takes a minute to realize that femininity is at once personal and universal and can be used as a weapon which is something that's so overlooked oh i don't know if it's oh I, would you i don't know if that's overlooked i think that's a trope from way back i think femininity well, as like a weapon f- is yes. has always been a thing femininity and- as strength rather than femininity as body i would say and that's i mean you could even take this discussion we're having of scarlet witch and take it to between willa and dana where Willow was really using her femininity as a weapon versus with her body mm-hmm. versus Dana using her femininity, not really even using her femininity, just kind of birthing this creature that she raised as a creature rather than in the normal Society. conventions that Willow raised Dylan in. 
But I think Willa, I think Willa kind of harnessed her femininity out of um, sure have to. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's ever the kind of woman she wanted to be. Agreed. I never, I think she never it wanted to be. the expectation. At, yes. That was put upon her that yes. she didn't feel like she could break uh -huh. out of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's like when Reese was saying she's completely shallow because like these are her priorities and she, he's like, I don't get it. And I'm like, of course you don't get it. You've never You're a 20 been a 20-something-year-old boy. Man. Yeah. You've never man. been a 30, 40-year-old mother of a six-year-old who still needs to fit in her size two jeans because mm -hmm. her husband expects it and she's got her mother and her mother law looking at her like she needs to be put together every single fucking mm -hmm. day of her life yeah. right like some uh, and like don't you live at the indoctrination of the suburban system that follows them everywhere correct yes. like you you have an expectation beyond your household mm -hmm. like i mean it goes outside of the the four walls if you will of your home and like there's so much out of your control that but that you're expected to live up to that like this is not what I necessarily signed up for. Right. This is not who I intended to be. This is not who I want to be. I'm doing the best I can, but at the same time, like, it's not. It's not who. I, it's not me. Mm -hmm. Well, Wanda had everything that she loved and cherished and cared about taken away from her, and people just expected her to be fine with it. Very much how Willa was forced into the situation she didn't want to be with. She didn't want to give. She didn't want to abort her first baby with someone who she, she was in love with. She wanted to be married with. to the musician. Yes. She wanted to be married to the musician. She wanted, and to, she wanted to have alone. that kid. Yes. But that wasn't what society, quote unquote, expected wanted from her. her or expected from her. Her mother functioning as like the vessel for societal expectations. Mm -hmm. And it kind of pushed her into this role. Like, you know you're going to marry someone successful. That's whose kid you're going to have. And you're going to be okay with it. We're really a last act group of people. What do you mean? <laughs> Oh, yeah, we're, we're fantastic. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, like, you know, there are those stories and, like, people who, stories, writers, who they build and build and build, and it's kind of, like, or, like roundabout, and then in the last act or the last third of the production, it's like, we're going to ram home everything we wanted to say this entire time, yes. and now we're going to say yes. it right now. <laughs> because we just, for, like, well, I mean, because we were just kind of, like, getting warmed up, and I right. think, and I, I don't know, I, we'll figure it, we'll figure it out. I'm trying to find, there was this part where the mothers were speaking, and I'm just trying to... We tap our feet outside the shower, and this is the mother's, right? Mm -hmm. We tap our feet outside the shower and then zip Willa into the tightest sequined dress in her closet. Long sleeves and a high neckline, a dress that outlines her figure, semi-contour armor. Diane stands back to consider her daughter. One can think one's own child is weak. One usually does. We turn away, polite, as Diane tugs Willa into Spanx. We're commuter wives. These are our commuter lives. We're capable of carrying alcoholic husbands from the kitchen to the bedroom in a fireman's grip. Between, between trains, we train to fight with enemies we haven't met yet, battling against punching bags, leaping like the world is made of stone walls, and we're storming them. There's another version of commuting, of course, as in to commute a sentence. This is our sentence. These suburbs, the train that does not stretch to meet them, we have not been commuted. We haven't slept in years. This is an advantage of menopause. Some nights we meet for coffee at 4 a.m. We stand on the balcony of one of our homes looking over the river, itemizing betrayals, watching the fools of this place walking from their dull dreams. We see plenty of things at that hour of the morning. I thought that was... <sighs> so good. So, especially, so much. Yeah, especially the line of... Um, on the train that will not stretch to meet us. Mm -hmm. And I think that is such an impactful sentence and then also such a good foreshadowing sentence mm -hmm. as well. Love it. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad we came back around. I'm sure I'll just, I think what I'll do, I'm not even gonna talk about it, I'll tell you about what I think I'm gonna do later. What I think I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna t thank you ladies so much for coming. Yes. Thank you for it's having great. us. I would love to do this again. Oh, me too. It's been a great episode. Yes. Till the next one. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for hanging out with Ape and Reba on this episode of Bitches and Bourbon. Make sure to check out the links in the show notes and we look forward to hearing from you. Until next time, here's to bad bitches and good bourbon. Cheers.